本期亚美有约由 Kindly Beauty 顶级连锁医美机构独家冠名播出。大家好，欢迎大家再次来到亚美有约，与优雅相伴，与美丽同行。我是主持人亚梅，今天我要很荣幸的给大家介绍本期亚美有约的特邀嘉宾，他就是澳大利亚杰出的慈善家，他曾经捐助了数百万给澳洲的医疗世界和慈善事业，他就是我们为之自豪的墨尔本的公民。Susan Elverty. Susan Elverty is a woman who has a successful mother, a woman, a philanthropist, and a woman of many different identities. The woman who is so respected is a woman who has a life experience. Susan 先后失去了丈夫和孩子。丈夫意外逝世时 ，Susan 必须脱离原有的职务，接管了所有建筑业务。为了撑起建筑公司，最后不得不面对健康也亮起红灯的自己，独自对抗了霍奇金淋巴瘤癌和心脏直视手术。饱经雪霜的苏珊，并没有因为逆境而放弃追寻希望。相反的，以个人为数十万美元的医疗救助而闻名，为在高校和大学教育中提供奖学金，支持弱势学生，并专注于通过体育活动来保持孩子的积极性。伟大源于经历，生命。在于传承，感恩命运的馈赠与索取。我们一同来聆听 Susan Alberti 的精彩故事。Susan, it's my great honor to have you on the show with us today. Thank you. I'm very honored to be here. Susan, I know you grew up in a public housing with your parents and older brother.、Mm -hmm. You married when you were quite young to an Italian immigrant、yes. who did not speak any English when he arrived. So, could you please tell us how you and your husband working together to build a such successful company? Well, Angelo came to Australia at the time of the credit squeeze, which was in 1959, and he had no English, no family, no money.、Mm. Uh, all he had was skills,、um, and、uh, he immediately looked for a job. And that was peeling paint off houses in Essendon, and then on the roads, digging up the roads. And of course,、um, he didn't speak English, but he quickly learnt English. Went to school, and was reading the newspaper and walking everywhere because he didn't know how to buy tickets on buses and trams. And and then of course he met me at a dance. And the first time he met me and asked me to dance, he didn't speak English.、Mm -hmm. and I thought it was very odd that he didn't talk, but then I didn't realise he didn't speak English. So then we were going out together for quite a few years, and he asked me to marry him. And I was about twenty at the time, and of course in those days you did marry younger than you do now. Yes. And we married when I was nearly twenty-one, and he was twenty-six.、Mm -hmm. And of course he had nothing,、uh, and I had nothing, but we had a burning desire to be successful,、mm -hmm. and to forge a business path. And of course,、um, being married,、uh, we were able to, you know, really forge that path. And he expanded into all sorts of areas, and I was working as well. And I was the girl in the back office, and I had another job somewhere else in a legal firm, and I was working seven days a week, and he was doing the same. So it was a constant、um, that we're always working long hours.、Uh, we had more than one business; we had five going at one time.、Mm -hmm. Plus, I was working part time in a legal office. I didn't know what it was like really to rest,、um, and I was doing everything at home. I didn't have anybody helping me at home, or didn't have gardeners. I didn't have housekeepers. I had no one, just my husband and I. And of course, we we forged a very good business. It just grew bigger and bigger and bigger, and、um, more and more、um, uh, uh, sacrifice.、Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, 
throughout that period too there was a lot of sickness uh, mm -hmm. with my husband with accidents on yeah. the job and uh, then we just built up a very large business businesses I guess you could say and then we decided to focus on one particular area which was the construction industry however at the same time as we were doing that we had four other businesses as well yeah so. I will tell you have a, uh, like a, uh, 300 staff well when my husband died was killed mm -hmm. we had 300 on the payroll yeah. Just on 300, so there was a lot of people, a lot of mouths to feed, mm -hmm. and a lot of responsibility for me because you know um, I was thrust into a very senior leadership role when mm -hmm. he died, yeah. and I had to make a choice at that time whether I was going to keep going with the business, sell off the business cheaply, mm -hmm. but I decided after a few weeks of really going going away and having a good think about what I wanted to do and. I decided I wanted to continue on with the business because I had projects that I had to complete yeah. and we were under contract and there were you know penalties if I didn't complete. Yeah, I know your husband suddenly passed away because of a traffic accident. Angela was killed by a drug affected driver mm -hmm. who left the scene of the accident not to be found but mm -hmm. I found him. So I had to, you know, in, in the midst of grief, mourning and sorrow, uh, I had to decide about what I was going to do and also at the same time my daughter was not well. So mm. it was a very difficult, difficult time for me. And also to be a leader, mm -hmm. uh, whilst I was suffering terribly myself, I had all these people looking to me for leadership and I couldn't mm. afford to be weak. Yeah. Um, and to be tough at the time. So at that time you have to have courage oh, yes. and the resilience. Yeah. Resilience. Uh, yeah. It's not easy. <laughs> mm. Not not at that particular time, but mm. I got through it. Mm, you got through it. Yeah, I got through it. We get yeah. through it. I remember I went to your office early last month. It was filled with a beautiful and moving painting done by your daughter. Mm -hmm. Then you can you see after you and your daughter how to move on uh, after your husband passed away. There was a lot of art in my daughter's uh, mm. of my daughter in my office. And with every painting, I know the story she's trying to tell. Mm -hmm. And I can see the times where she used vibrant colors. Mm -hmm. I can see the time where she was struggling with her eyesight and the dribble of the paint. Mm -hmm. And um, I look at them every day. They remind me so much of Danielle and the periods that she went through in her life. Yes. When she was diagnosed, when she was struggling, when she was really sick. Mm -hmm. And um, I feel she's very close to me. Uh, when I'm in the office with her art mm. on the walls. Oh, yes. And I, I see messages all the time from Danielle. And mm -hmm. um, she was able to express herself. Mm. But I, I can't do it in art. I can't show it in art like she could show it in her art. It was always a story with Danielle and her art. And it took me a while to understand exactly what she was trying to say. But I do but understand you can feel it. I can feel it. Whereas I'm different. Uh, I'm not an artist. I appreciate mm. art. I love art. I love mm. the the arts, but um, I do things in a different way. Mm. Uh, I express myself in a different way to my daughter. Danielle's was in her art. She is a beautiful, uh, kind and generous mm. lady, and I, I think with her upbringing from her mother and father, she learnt a lot from us. She learned how to be kind and caring, but at the same time she was able to express herself um, with her art. Yeah, you look like you can feel her yes. around you. Yes. Yeah, I do. I do feel I can feel her uh, mm. each day when I go into the office and it makes me happy to see her art on the wall. Um, every day I wake up in our bedroom and I see her beautiful portrait of when she graduated from university and what a beautiful young woman mm. she was and how bright and she had the whole world and you know, a future in front of her uh, but she didn't make it. Uh, uh, well Danielle was in New York and mm. um, she was not telling me everything because yeah. she didn't want to worry me because I had mm. a huge workload. I had nearly 300 people, I had eight projects, in fact it was increasing. Mm. And she thought her mother had enough to worry about. This is my daughter. I only found this out when I got yeah. over there. So I didn't know she was as sick as what she was. But one particular night, in the middle of the night, I received a phone call mm. from a specialist, a kidney specialist, to say, your daughter is very ill. She needs a kidney. You better get over here. So, of course, I packed my bags and left within 24 hours mm. to go over there, not realising that 
yes, she did need dialysis. She did need a kidney. It was that serious. Mm -hmm. But prior to getting there, a couple of her colleagues from university in Philadelphia had mm -hmm. put up their hand and offered their kidney. And they went to Mount Sinai where they were doing all the testing. And of course, these young women were not compatible. Mm -hmm. So as soon as I got over there, I went straight to the specialist and he was a very cold person. He said, your daughter's very sick. She needs a kidney. What are you going to do about it? I've just arrived at six o'clock in the morning and you got me here. I'm, I mean, I've hardly slept. And I said, well, I'll go and do the testing at Mount Sinai. So I went immediately to Mount Sinai and I was tested and I was compatible. Oh, good. So Danielle needed some dialysis anyhow because the kidneys were failing or they had failed. And they gave her dialysis. And with that, we were given the green light to bring her home mm. to Australia. It was suggested maybe I wanted to stay in America, but I had no support, no family. Oh, yes. And she didn't want to stay there. She wanted to come home. Mm. And she knew she had a kidney waiting, my kidney. Yeah. And I didn't know the night before we left, she'd had a very long conversation with my brother. She didn't tell me. My daughter was a very quiet... Yeah, more yeah. Yes, yeah. very different to her mum. I'm, I'm more outgoing, friendly. Mm. Danielle was introverted. Um, very serious young lady. She talked to my brother, who she loved dearly, and my brother offered his kidney as well, and I mm. didn't know. Mm. I didn't know this till we were on the plane that this had happened with Danielle. So with the green light, we made arrangements, uh, but I couldn't get her out of the country straight away because her visa had expired. Mm. So the Australian um, uh, embassy were wonderful in getting that all going okay. and, and get signing off and getting her, you know, making it available for her to be able to leave the country and come home to Australia. It was all very complicated. And I was sort of on the phone, Australian time, American time, I was mm. exhausted. And so we got on the plane and um, from New York to Los Angeles, she was okay. She was not comfortable, but she was okay. And then we got to Los Angeles and uh, we got a wheelchair for yeah, her to take to her stop. to the Qantas yes. Lounge. Mm. I got her into the lounge and she got out of a chair to walk and she collapsed and um, she said mum I don't think I can make it I said oh yes you can Danielle there's a new life waiting for you mm. we can do this Danielle I'm here for you I don't know mum I don't think I can make it I said yes you will and um, I was in two minds I didn't know what to do mm. but I knew I'd been I'd been advised by the doctors in New York she was okay to bring her home, otherwise I yes. wouldn't have done it. Mm. They'd all signed off for me, so I would never have taken that risk. So we got on the plane into Los Angeles, out of Los Angeles. About two hours out of Los Angeles, Danielle really started to become quite ill. Mm. She was running a high temperature, she was thrashing, her in her, thrashing around mm. in her seat. She was in a lot of pain. She was trying to take off her clothes because she was so hot. Um, and uh, she said, Mum, my back is so sore. So she said, would you rub me? And mm. I said, of course, Danielle, I'll rub your back. You know, I didn't know what else to do. And um, I could see things were deteriorating. Mm. I tried to do a blood test on her and I couldn't keep her still to do it. I wanted to know if she was high or low. Um, I got a drink to her thinking she was low. Um, I still don't know whether she was low or high. Mm. So I called for a doctor. There were two on the plane, one from Adelaide and one from yeah, Melbourne. Yeah. And one was a specialist actually, which was very handy. And by the time they got to the seat, they were behind in business class. By the time the staff had got to them, uh, the wonderful crew on Qantas, can't speak more highly of Qantas crew, mm -hmm. um, Danielle asked me to hold her because she was in so much pain. Yes. And as I held her, she gurgled. She took her last breath mm -hmm. and she died in my arms. Yeah, that's right. And I knew, and I knew it was a heart attack because all down the side of her face, um, I could see where she'd had the heart attack. I knew oh. it was a heart attack. And by that time, just as that happened, the doctors arrived, mm. but there was nothing they could do. She was gone. They couldn't resuscitate. They couldn't do anything. They did try, um, mm. and of course, I just was stunned. I, I, I couldn't believe what had happened. I just couldn't believe it. she'd actually died. Yeah. And then um, the adrenaline kicks in. Mm -hmm. um, what do I do now? But I have to say that the staff on that plane were the most remarkably well-trained team mm -hmm. and knew what to do, exactly what to do. So we lay Danielle down, we covered her. 
And I was in the seat next to her, uh, watching all this, not showing any emotion whatsoever. I was just like a robot on automatic. And, um, and as she lay there and they left me alone to spend that time with Danielle, mm -hmm. um, uh, the doctors left me as well to see it. They wanted to know if I was all right. And I said, yeah, I'm fine. And I looked at her, I pulled the blanket back and I said, Danielle, I promise you, I will never, ever give up. You've fought a hard battle. You've fought a really tough battle. I'm your mum and I'm never going to give up. Sorry. Yeah. And I, I've never given up. Yeah. And I'll continue mm -hmm. to fight the battle because there's more than one Danielle in the world with this disease. It's an insidious disease. It impacts on too many children. It's the complications that mm -hmm. kill um, our children and people with diabetes is not diabetes. Mm -hmm. As I say, she nearly killed herself by not taking insulin. Mm -hmm. And with type one, if you don't have insulin, you do die. Wow. Um, I guess that was a call for help, but I did all I could do for her. And um, I've never given up. That was um, 15, uh, she was 32 when she died. That was, um, she died in 2001, so it's 16 years ago yeah. Yeah. since she died. I haven't lost any of the um, desire mm. um, to help others that have got the disease. And um, that's what I'll do till the day I die. Yeah. I know it's not easy to say goodbye, especially no. to those people close to your heart. No. Oh, it mm. hurts, but you know, she'd lost her father. Mm. He was my mate. Yeah. He was my soul mate. He was my business partner. We'd done yeah. so much and achieved so much together. I just got over that and I was trying really hard to manage that. Yes. My daughter was getting sick, quite sick. And then of course she died. Mm. But what happened also in that same year, my mother died and my father died. Oh yeah. So it was more than that. And mm. I was trying to cope with I refused to go to a cemetery mm. for nearly two years after I said I can't go to another funeral. I can't take this uh, all this death. Um, but anyhow, you rise above it. Um, mm, you have to stand up. Yeah, I had responsibilities. Um, I had a duty of care to all our staff and mm. they were looking to me for leadership. I had to decide what I wanted to do how I was going to handle everything. It was a very big job yeah, I had at that no, time. You had a wonderful, wonderful life. <laughs> oh, I've had a very interesting life. Yes. I've had more troughs than I've had. I've had more lows and highs, that's for mm. sure. Um, but um, it's made me who I am. Mm. And uh, I guess I've come out of it at the other end stronger than I've ever been. Many aware of success, your philanthropy had had made on community. Mm. So could you able to share the reason that led you to do so? Well, my support of philanthropy goes back to when I was six years old. Mm. It's not something that I developed in the last 20 or 30 years. When I attended my school, um, I had religious nuns teach me, in both schools, mm. primary and secondary. And in about grade one or two, the nuns instilled in me a need to support the community and to give back to the community. Mm. It didn't have to be in a large way, it could be in very small ways of caring about the person next to me, caring about the community I live in, caring about other countries who are not as well off as we are in Australia. So it really, it started when I was about six years of age. My father was such a role model. Um, he was heavily involved in, with St Vincent de Paul for about 55 years, right up until the day he died. And I don't recall any Christmas morning that my father was at home. He was out uh, with his meagre salary, mm -hmm. buying presents and feeding the oh, poor, okay. um, because that was my father. Mm. And that's what he also instilled in me too, about giving back to the community that I lived in and not always think about myself. There were always people worse off or needed help more than you did. And I often wondered if that was the case, mm -hmm. because where I lived and how I grew up, it was a very meagre salary from mm -hmm. my father. We didn't have much, but we had love. We had strict um, rules in our home um, and we had curfews and I had good role models in parents. So we may not have had the monetary um, things that a lot of kids have today, mm -hmm. or, but we certainly had good role models and um, good parents. So it just followed through from there, from primary school to secondary school. 
was reinforced by the religious nuns again in my secondary school about giving back to the community, not, keep, not always thinking about yourself, but caring about other people. And, and I always think that if you're successful in business, mm -hmm. you should be giving back. Mm -hmm. It should not always be about you. It's about making a difference, yeah. encouraging others to follow you. Because, you know, I, I, I get incredible satisfaction about making, whether I was six years old, with my thruppens in the money box to help the missions in the Solomon Islands, or to helping medical research or diabetes mm. research, I guess, just get the same satisfaction because I know I've made a small difference in the world I live in. Yeah, I know you donated a lot of money to mm. the like a diabetes research. Mm -hmm. uh, why? Well, I've extended it beyond diabetes now because mm. of my own um, sicknesses and I've been quite ill. But certainly diabetes research it goes back 35 years mm. when my then 12-year-old was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Mm. And when she was diagnosed, um, I made lots of investigations and inquiries about who was doing what in this country. Mm to discover there are only two researchers. And we didn't have Google, we didn't have internet, we had the yellow and the white pages, so I had to thumb through that to find out the names of these people. So I was disturbed that there wasn't any, um, research happening in Australia. And then of course I became involved with a, an organisation that uh, was offering support and education because families didn't have any of that available. There are other, there are other organisations, but they were not offering that at the time mm -hmm. and I thought I could make a difference but that lasted with me for about six months because I like to do things I want mm -hmm. to be more tangible and fundraise because I was in a hurry yes. I wanted to find a cure and if I could find a solution that's what I wanted albeit it's yeah. been a while. So do you start this before um uh, before your daughter passed away or after Oh, that? well and truly, well and truly. Danielle was 32 when she died. I'd been doing it for more than 20 years, mm. uh, involved in medical research. Okay. But I did it when Danielle was diagnosed and uh, I used to go into the children's hospital and talk to other families who'd been diagnosed. But I was not getting enough out of that. I wanted to put more back in. I wanted to find a solution to the problem. Mm. That's who I am. Mm. Got a problem, I've got to fix it. I've got to yeah. find a solution to a problem. Here's a huge challenge here. Yeah. And if I can make a contribution, that's what I wanted to do. And I wanted to improve my daughter's life mm. because she was asking all sorts of questions from um, doctors who wouldn't give her an answer. It was a case of, you go home, do as you're told and you'll be fine. Well, not with my daughter. She had lots of questions that were not being answered. And she'd come to me and I couldn't answer the questions either because I didn't have the knowledge. So I thought, well, I've got to find out. And there surely must be other parents out there with children with similar problems, you know, questions from their children. My daughter was very intelligent mm -hmm. and she was, you know, being patronised mm -hmm. by so many doctors and not getting the answers. Now, I'm not saying that's the reason why Danielle didn't accept it. That was part of the reason. But Danielle was a, a woman that wouldn't accept, um, you wouldn't accept the disease. Mm -hmm. I remember she uh, went to New York for yes. study. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell me something about that? Yes, when her father was tragically killed, um, mm -hmm. and we both had to turn off the mm -hmm. life support, mm -hmm. she yes. broke her heart. Mm -hmm. And she was going to complete a master's degree here at Melbourne University where she'd done her original degree. Mm -hmm. But she decided she needed to go away and find her own identity. Yeah. So with unbeknown to me, she'd applied for a scholarship at Temple University in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And she said, Mum, I'm leaving. I think she said to me, Mum, I'm leaving in two weeks' time. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh my goodness. Uh, so she left and she rented an apartment in Philadelphia and attended Temple for a short time, but then they weren't really covering what she wanted to do. She wanted to complete her masters. So she went to the Academy of Fine Arts in Philadelphia, where she did complete her masters and made lots of friends there in Philadelphia. So when she completed that and she was working on campus because I didn't know, but she'd applied for a scholarship. She didn't ask her mother and father, well her father had died. She didn't ask me for any financial support. So I was very proud of her that she'd done that I didn't Independently, know. Independently, yes. Independent. We taught her that, right, growing up. 
it was very important to be independent and find your own way, not just think it's going to happen because yeah. mum and dad can do it. So she then completed her masters and made lots of lovely friends at, um, at Temple and at the Academy of Fine Arts in Philadelphia and then decided to move to New York because she wanted to exhibit her mm -hmm. art. And when she was at um, the Academy of Fine Arts, they had a final exhibition of art and Danielle's art was put into the exhibition and within 20 minutes all her art was sold for oh. nearly 150,000, this is going back now, 150,000 yes. US dollars which was worth a lot more mm. then than it is now. But I didn't know this. Mm. She had set up a scholarship in perpetuity for another international student to be given the opportunity to study at the mm. university who would not otherwise get an opportunity. I found out on the day of her funeral mm -hmm. by her executor what she'd done and of course that made me so proud of my yeah, daughter. I that, too, yeah. that was really really special when Danielle I found that out. And um, when she went to New York to exhibit mm. but when she got to New York she did a little of that but she was starting to become very sick yeah. and her eyesight was failing and um, she was finding it very difficult to draw even okay. though she was still drawing with great difficulty and I could see in her art myself that she mm. was struggling. Um, she couldn't exhibit as much as she wanted to but she was still determined. Mm. She was still going to exhibit and she would take her um, portfolio and visit the galleries and I don't know how she did it. She was so sick but she'd still go and make appointments and visit the art galleries with a view to exhibiting. But before she'd left Australia, she'd already made um, another organisation here in Australia, wanted to exhibit her work. Mm -hmm. And when she was in New York, not long before she died, they said, we're going to exhibit your work. Can you be available, blah, blah, blah. And of course, Danielle that said, yes. Was well, Danielle never ever got to that exhibition. Oh. She died. So I decided, mm. I'd make sure that exhibition was held in Melbourne mm -hmm. and that was an outstanding success. So I know Danielle had a very big future mm -hmm. in um, fine arts, mm -hmm. arts, history of art, mm -hmm. curating, she'd done curating as well. So she had a big career in front of her and I know that if diabetes hadn't have impacted on her, mm -hmm. well, she had so much.